This morning, we are picking back up in the book of Revelation. We're going to be looking at the reign of Christ begin. And where we're at is in Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Now, prior to this, we were looking at the uh, destruction of Babylon and all that's involved in the destruction of Babylon in chapter 18. You know, where God is calling his people, he's instructing them to actually leave Rome because Rome is going to be destroyed. It's going to be completely destroyed. And that would have been prior to what is coming on or what's going to happen to her because he does this so that they are not fellowshipping with her strikes. They're not involved in the strikes that she's about to face. So he's called them out. In one day, Babylon will be totally destroyed. Um, and it's not just the city of Rome will be destroyed. It is along with the city of Rome, or really we should probably say it the other way around, along with the religious system, which is Babylon, the city of Rome is also going to be destroyed. And we looked at the significance of where it, it's repetitive in some of the statements, fallen, fallen, whoa, whoa. There's some actual significance to those. It's not just be repeating things because um, we see it actually in the repetition and the way it's used, really showing that there's two different things that are actually falling at that time. We have the religious system that's being utterly destroyed, and we have the city itself that's going to be destroyed. And then we are looking at the rejoicing of the heavens and the blood of the saints and the apostles and the prophets were found in her. Now, of course, the saints here is talking about um, the tribulation saints, along with apostles and the prophets, uh, which would be a, a New Testament prophets is where the focus is on that. And of course, we see God righteously judged her. He rewarded her unjustly for what she did. And that does actually indicate, because she's going to be paid back double, that her fall is going to be extremely violent so violent that the kings of the earth and the merchants stand far off they're they're not they're afraid because it's so destructive you know this is what's going to happen to her now we come to really a section where there's four hallelujahs and in this we have two specific hallelujahs that relate to the harlot and her being judged and this is in revelation chapter 19 verses 1 through 3. So in Revelation chapter 19, verse 1, we see that salvation is of our God. He's the one who brings salvation. And after these things, I heard a great sound of a crowd of many in the heaven saying, Hallelujah, the salvation and the proper opinion and the inherent ability of our God. Now, remember, in the context after these things is after the destruction of Babylon. And we did, in going through that, do want to remember that, that Babylon is not destroyed mid-tribulation period. Uh, that is really taken from an assumption that the man of lawlessness is not going to want any other religious systems around. But when we look at over in uh, Thessalonians, in the book there, um, Second Thessalonians, the man of lawlessness sets himself up above all other things that are called gods. She's actually destroyed uh, just near the end of the tribulation period. So that's what's going on at this point. So she's been destroyed. So we're right near the end of the tribulation period. She's been destroyed. And then we have this sound in the heavens of this hallelujah. God is the one, of course, he's going to bring salvation. He brings victory over the harlot. Now, remember, for the last seven years, almost, seven years she has been reigning over the earth and she has basically been murdering all of the saints and she murders them as a sacrifice to a religious system that she has set up in verse uh, 18 or chapter 18 verse 4 and i heard another voice out from the heaven saying come out of her my people in order that you are not fellowshipping with her sins and out from her strikes in order that you should not receive them so they are not to participate with her sins, and they are to be separated so that her strikes they don't actually face. Now, it does talk about here about having a proper opinion of God. And remember, our word glory actually means that. 
So in her destruction, the world is going to see a proper, an expression of a proper opinion of God. He is the one who is mighty. He is the one who is strong. The harlot and the kings of the earth, they thought that she was actually strong. The harlot herself thought she was strong. Revelation chapter 18, verse 7, and then verse 10 also. In uh, 10 here, it says, Far away they stand because of the fear of their torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, Babylon, the strong city, because in one hour your judgment came. So they see her, the kings of the earth see her as strong, as mighty. In verse 7, it says, As much as she gave herself also glory and a luxurious lifestyle, you all give to her so much torment and mourning because in her heart, she says that I sit a queen and I am not a widow and I will never see mourning. I will never see sorrow or suffering. That was her attitude. That's that religious system. That's its attitude. We will always reign. We're strong. But yet we see God is the one who's actually strong in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 8. Where it says, because of this, in one day her strike will come. Death and mourning and famine, and with fire she will be burned because the Lord God who judges her is strong. Now, it uses that specific word strong here. It's showing that God is the one who's actually strong. She's not strong. And you see here, death and mourning and famine and fire all in one day. So like I said, her overthrow is going to be extremely violent. And rightfully so. She deserves every bit of it. So we're going to be seeing his inherent ability also. So along with his glory, we see his inherent billing, ability. She is laid waste in one hour. Now, again, this is a very powerful entity from the perspective of humans. She rules over nations. Okay, she basically, the, the harlot here, there's Babylon the harlot, is actually the governing body for all religious systems upon the earth at this point. So she's got a lot of power. And he's going to destroy her in one hour. He's going to utterly decimate her. Verse 19, this is in, still in chapter 18. And they cast dust upon their heads, crying while weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which everyone having ships in the sea was made wealthy out from her uh, wealth because in one hour she was laid waste. So now we're not just talking destroying, it's totally laid waste. Jerusalem. Yeah, it, she, she would still have substantial authority and power. Um, there's a shift in the attitude towards the 10 kings and the beast, which in the and it does actually give us the timeline. That's where... Starting in the chapter 18, we actually have a, an anchor there for the timing, which puts us right near the end of the tribulation period. Um, and that's where we're going through that. That's where, like, you know, I've got to correct that because most will say it's in the middle of the tribulation period. But the reality is where it's describing her destruction, it's right at the end. There's a sudden change. So we have a religious system that wants all religious authority, yet we have the man of lawlessness <coughs> setting himself up as a god. She's based upon a fleshly system. Envy, jealousy, we're going to see that in her. And we're going to see a change in the attitude of the ten kings and the beast towards her. So yeah, she's still going to be there, but she's going to have to be uh, subject to the man of lawlessness who is claiming to be god. So she'll be there for that time, but we're going to see jealousy come about, and she's probably going to try to destroy him or try to politically ruin him or something like that, because there's something that changes to where, uh, and remember, it doesn't say hate. It says they're indifferent to her. So they get to the point to where they don't care whether she is successful or not. You know, she, she, They could care less about her. Now, prior to this, they did care. Why? Because she was actually bringing them on to uh, the world scene. The political power comes as a result of the religious system actually bringing in the man of lawlessness. So, so yeah, scripture, the way it describes it, she will actually still have 
substantial authority over the nations in a religious sense while the man of lawlessness is setting himself up as God you know, during that first or that last three and a half years. And I would agree with you, and, I, and that's the way that I had always seen that. But in going through chapter 18, I'm like, no, we have an anchor of time you can't ignore. You know, because we that's the one thing about revelations, you have to pay attention to where are things stopping and starting and shifting, you know, because they're shifting all the time. Mm -hmm. In the beginning of 18, we have an anchor on the timing, but we don't have a shift because it specifically says after these things. And it is on after the sixth strike that comes upon the followers of the beast that puts it right near the end of the tribulation period so that's where that anchor suddenly comes from so i was like hey, you know i'm wrong on that we need to correct it she actually is set, still uh, set up until then good good point yes um more than likely well actually it's not really more than likely the way that it's described the head of this religious system that they're calling babylon the harlot is actually a male not a female uh, it's a male and in there there does seem to be one like similar to not the same as but similar to the pope similar concept so where was that reference we're actually going to get into that again um, well, no, it's a good point because it's a very subtle um, reference to the king of Babylon. And if you're not paying attention to the context, you won't realize it that Babylon had been destroyed before that. So how can it be referencing the king of Babylon? You know, it had it, it's a reference to the future that's going to happen. But that's all the information we get about it. Remember, it's mystery Babylon. Mystery means the information is revealed to us but it was not revealed in the old testament you can't go back to the old testament and you can't find it there um, the same thing with christ's death burial and resurrection you cannot find that in the old testament revealed unless you filter it through the information that's found in the new testament a lot of people make that mistake and then they go back and they they have all of these references to Christ in the Old Testament. Jesus was never referenced in the Old Testament. You know, other than the fact that the Messiah would come, and there's a few areas where now that we have more revelation, we can see what God was talking about. But from an Old Testament perspective, they would have never understood that. And a good example of this was is with Adam and Eve. What were they told? The seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. They were not told how. They weren't told that Messiah is going to come and save the nation of, of Israel. Israel didn't even exist at that point. Uh, or any nation for that matter. There was only two of them. They weren't told about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. None of that. So some people will go back and they'll push that into it. Now, we, because we have new revelation, can see that's what he was referring to. That's how it's going to happen. But we can't, when you're reading from the Old Testament, you don't want to put that interpretation into it. So it's the same thing with Babylon. We don't have anything in the Old Testament other than a, a, a couple of general references, and that's it, because it's a mystery. It wasn't revealed. But it is now actually revealed to us. Now, it isn't revealed in the sense that we fully see her because she's not active right now. But a lot of the information about what's going to happen when she's going to uh, uh, come onto the scene and really what she's going to be doing is actually revealed to us. Yeah. You can see forecasting there, but not a reference to the actual um, harlot, Babylon. Or not exact, not to the to the actual one that is being described in Revelation 18. So yeah, there are little breadcrumbs in the Old Testament, yeah. but you would have never understood it without New Testament revelation. I mean, they like said even the reference that we'll get to where the King of Babylon is referred to, and it's pretty clear that it's talking about um, 
right at the end of well it's actually in the millennial kingdom because they take up a state where really they have a a proverb concerning the king of babylon and how babylon was destroyed um which means it can't be the previous the historical babylon that wouldn't make any sense and we know that historical babylon was not destroyed in the way that it's being described here in, in revelation chapter 18 so it's talking about a mystery along with uh well mystery babylon in that sense so she's going to be laid waste very interesting topic and really it is important to keep its timeline correct because many commentaries and like i said i grew up with the understanding that the that the mystery babylon is going to be destroyed at mid-tribulation period but when i really began to examine that and looking especially like i said at verse 18 or chapter 18 where it says after these things and it gives us a very specific anchor to the timeline it has to be at the end of the tribulation period it's just before christ returns and they're going to uh, the, and god is going to use the 10 kings well really it's seven kings at that point but he's still going to use them along with the man of lawlessness to utterly destroy her and then the city is going to be completely burned down there's going to be nothing left of it so both the religious system and the city are going to be destroyed and remember fallen fallen that's really important to pay attention to both of those 18 2 where it says and he cried in a strong voice saying she has fallen she has fallen it's not just being there's not just repetition there just to be more emphatic there's a specific reason why each one is, is repeated and you know we went through and we looked at other passages of scripture that kind of show that same pattern you know we see with the three woes whoa 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 to the earth we got three woes coming there's a reason why it's repeated As a matter of fact by the way in repetition outside of this why is it when you hear the uh, spirit beings in, in the throne saying holy 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 are they really trying to convince everybody that God is holy? Or is there a specific reason they're actually saying it three times? And we know from New Testament Revelation, there's a trinity, and they are actually saying it specifically for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because each member of the Godhead is an individual himself. Just interesting the way Scripture does that. Also, Revelation uh, 18.10, where you have, whoa, whoa. Uh, the great city babylon the strong city is actually destroyed so the harlot was judged now in revelation chapter 19 and verse 2 it goes on it says because his judgments are true and righteous because his because he has judged the great harlot which corrupted the earth by her fornication and he avenged the blood of his servants out from her hands so you're going to see that he does actually avenge the blood of those that were murdered by her judgment upon the source of the fornication upon the earth is where this is going to be at because remember she is considered to be the mother of harlots so there's going to be other harlots around which is why she's saying i will never be one who mourns i will never be one who's a widow no she has other harlots that are a spin-off of her but she's the actual source. No longer will false religions rule upon the earth. At this point, false religions will come to an end. In the millennial kingdom, there will be no false religions upon the earth. The prophecy concerning the mystery of Babylon is fulfilled. Now we see over in Isaiah chapter 13, verses 19 through 22, we're talking about that. Here it says, in Babylon, the beautiful kingdom, the glory of the Chaldean pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation, nor will the Arab pitch his tent there, nor will shepherds make their flocks lie down there, but desert uh, creatures will lie down there, and their homes will be full of owls. Ostriches also will live there, and shaggy goats with 
will frolic there, or in other words, there's not going to be any humans living around. Nobody is actually, you know, it's going to be basically a place where animals, typically the animals you don't want to be around because they, they take care of the dead things. Hyenas, um, jackals, as it also talks about there. Her fateful time also will soon come and her days will not be prolonged. That this would this is a uh, reference to mystery Babylon. This is uh, the when it's talking about here in Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 19 through 22, it's prophecy concerning the destruction of mystery Babylon, not of the historical Babylon. And that is actually a good point. Historical Babylon never was destroyed this way. It, it, you don't see that in history. Um, but as we just got through in chapter 18, the description of the way that uh, the mystery Babylon is going to be destroyed is exactly this. Nobody during the millennial kingdom is going to enter that area ever. They're going to, it's going to be completely given up. And we also see that a little bit like later. He has avenged the blood of the saints. Now, this would be the tribulation saints at her hands. Remember, these saints are the ones who she slaughters. And she slaughters them as though she's doing religious service to God. Romans chapter 12 and verse 19 talks about this. Do not take vengeance for yourself, beloved, but give a place for wrath. For it is, a, for it is in a state of having been written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You know, we know that statement, but sometimes it's really hard to wait. But yet, we are given a picture of what is going, when this is going to actually come about. God is going to avenge the blood of the saints. The saints do not need to avenge their own blood. He's going to utterly destroy them and keep his word. Then we have hallelujah again. The harlot smoke ascends into the ages of the ages. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 3. Actually, I think this is the, yeah, this is the second hallelujah. And a second hallelujah, they said, hallelujah, and her smoke ascends into the ages of the ages. Now, obviously, this isn't going to be literal smoke from the city. But it is going to, as we see, there's a reference to her, um, her judgment will be a proverb in the millennial kingdom. Revelation chapter 14, verses 4 through 7 is where we see that. In, um, I said Revelation, didn't I? I mean, Isaiah. Isaiah 14, 4 through 7. So in Isaiah 14, starting in verse 4, it says that you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon and say how the oppressor has ceased and how fury has ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers, which used to strike the people in fury with unceasing strokes, which subdue the nations in anger with unrestrained persecution. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into shouts of joy. Now, if you follow in the context here, you go back in Isaiah chapter 14. Israel is at rest in the millennial kingdom when this is actually described. So it's not describing historical Babylon. It is a describing really uh, a Babylon that's in the future. That is one of the very few references in the Old Testament that we see to mystery Babylon. But again, they wouldn't have understood it because they didn't have enough revelation. We understand it because as we go back, we see in the timeline, well, this can't be referring to the the king of Babylon, the historic one, because that's already been destroyed, and Israel is now at rest, but yet they're going to take up, it, here it says a taunt, it's really going to be a proverb against the uh, king of Babylon, and that would be mystery Babylon. Then it goes on to talk about the fact that the rule of our Lord has begun, and this is in chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. The 24 elders instructing others to praise the Lord is where we start out with. Now, remember that 24 elders is the church. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. 
Uh, 24 elders, like I said, are a representation of the resurrected church. And we see this over in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 4. Uh, when we were going through there, we also looked at the details that are given about the 24 elders, and they are specific to only what the church receives, the crowns. So very important to pay attention to. That's actually only something the church receives. So in Revelation chapter 4, we have a picture of what's happening in the heavens after the rapture, after the the church has been fully resurrected and actually then changes into the bride at that point, the bride of Christ. Around the throne were 24 elders, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed with white garments and golden crowns on their head. Now remember your word crowns, there is a stephanos, the victor's crown. Who are the ones who are victorious? They are the ones who believe that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. Hallelujah, by the way, is a command to praise. It is not praise. So when you hear somebody say hallelujah, you should follow that up with some praise, not a repeat of hallelujah. You know, the way it's used today is really very inappropriate because it's hallelujah, 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 but nobody praises God. Nobody responds properly to it. So what is being said here? is to get others to respond and praise God. So when they say hallelujah, it really is a command saying you praise God. So let's praise it. What is praise? It's the fruit of our lips confessing his name. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. This is where it gives us a definition. If you have a translation that uses the word thanks, giving thanks, it's a bad translation. You need to change it to the word confess. Because some of our translations over in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, will say the sacrifice of praise, which is giving thanks to his name, but it's actually the word confession. And it's important to pay attention to because confession means to say the same thing. And name is talking about character. And while we're in the third heaven, at this point. So it would be to those who are in the third heaven where you have a response. Now, it's not just the church because we also have many tribulation saints who are up there at this point. So, and more specifically, when in relation to the harlot, you have those who were actually slaughtered by the harlot below the, uh, um, the altar. So they're there. At this point, and this is where you, you have that hallelujah response. Not to mention, we also have untold amounts of spirit beings that are watching this and, and learning about God as a result of it. So, yeah, we're going to have that response to all of them. All of God's servants and the ones fearing him were instructed to give praise. And this is in verse 9. And a voice from the throne came saying, you give praise to our God, all his servants and the ones fearing him, the little ones and the great. So we get specifically where this is coming to. Now here, it doesn't use the word hallelujah. By the way, hallelujah is actually a um, transliterated word from the Hebrew. So it's not actually translated. But here in verse 5, it actually uses the word praise, which would be how you would translate it. You give praise. So it actually literally gives us the, the inter, uh, proper uh, interpretation of it. Our God, the Almighty, has begun to reign. This is in verse 9. <clears throat> and I heard a voice of a large crowd also as a, as a sound of many waters, also as a sound of strong thunders, hallelujah, because our God, our Lord, the God, has begun to reign. Now, the timing here, again, is something that's very important to pay attention to. And unfortunately, the clock is catching me. So I'm going to have to do a quick little summary of this, and then we'll have to come back to it. It's important to pay attention to the timing, because it is not saying that the Lord God reigns. It's actually looking at the very beginning of his reign, which means we're still in the third heaven 
and the tribulation period is at it's coming right at its end but we still have the man of lawlessness here on earth when this happens when does it begin when christ asks the father for the nations and the father says they're yours go take them how does he do that he returns and he wages a righteous war against the man of lawlessness and the nations and he destroys them. so that's what's about so right now in verse in chapter 19 verse 6 we are focusing on the very beginning so we're still in the third heaven so some of the things that are going to be happening at this point we're still focused there in the third heaven we're not yet down here on beast us. is still alive beast is still alive at this point yep beast the the false prophet and they're still you could say to some degree ruling over the earth uh right basically around about this time we have the uh massive army coming up the river euphrates uh, because remember that whole you know the the, uh, the battle of armageddon that whole thing does not start with them attacking god it's really a fight among themselves where they realize hey the problem is jerusalem not us then the kings in the it starts as a big war which we'll get into more detail on that but i, I gotta we got a break now for uh, communion so we're gonna go ahead and break <laughs>